London, winter 1608. You wake early as the morning light streams into your garret, tucked away in the attic of a building on the bank of the River Thames. You stretch, roll over and prepare yourself to rise. But today, something is amiss. You stop and listen. Everything sounds different. You can't hear the traffic of boats passing by or the rush of the water from the Thames, but this isn't anything new. In fact, the river that runs right by your window has been frozen for weeks, a not unusual occurrence to you. You're living through the period history would come to refer to as the Little Ice Age. This is a freezing phenomenon you've likely seen before. What you can hear are sounds of merriment, of trades being plied, of carriages drawn, not from the streets behind, but from the frozen river. There's something going on out there, beyond your four walls, on the ice, that's more dazzling, more chilling, more spectacular to behold than anything you've seen before. For January 1608 marks the beginning of the first ever official frost fair, the logistics of which seem truly alien to us living today. This was a fair held on the frozen River Thames, literally right on top of the ice. The ice was thick, solid and sturdy enough that horse-drawn coaches could wheel across it. Food could be cooked over coal fires kindled in the middle of the ice, and traders could ply their wares over its frozen depths. Now, 1608 wasn't the first time the River Thames had frozen over by any stretch. As Dr. Will Tosh tells us, older Londoners could remember skidding their way across the ice as they crossed the city directly to Bankside. You, watching from your garret window, may well have been one of them. In the past, the late Queen Elizabeth had even taken to the frozen river on her sled. But 1608 was the first officially designated frost fair. So the antics you witness as you dress quickly and step out onto the ice are something of a spectacle. Equally, 1608 wasn't the last time the people of London thronged to the frozen surface of the Thames for food, entertainment and pageantry. Over the next hundred years, Frost fairs became more and more big budget. The icy antics became more daring. During the frost fair of 1621, the ice was so thick that teenagers felt confident in burning a gallon of wine upon the Thames, while a woman asked her husband to impregnate her upon the frozen river. The most extravagant fair took place in 1683 to 84, when the Thames froze for 10 weeks and the ice reached a thickness of 11 inches. Traders of all sorts set up shops, publishers established presses to print special frost fair souvenir cards, and entertainers offered bull and bear baiting, puppet plays, and all manner of lewd tippling. The festivities were publicised widely. Broadsides and flyers were hastily printed, advertising the fair as Great Britain's Wonder or London's Admiration, and people travelled to take part in all manner of activities atop the frozen river, from ice skating and fox hunting to novelties which have lost their meaning with us today, such as a Tory booth or the Dutch cheer sliding round. Looking at the Thames today, it's so difficult, I think, to imagine how this was possible. But in 1608, Northern Europe was in the middle of the Little Ice Age, a period of extreme cold that lasted from around the middle of the 14th century to the early to mid 19th century. Dr. Cat from Reading the Past has made a video that goes into much, much more detail about the logistics and history of the Little Ice Age and how it created the perfect conditions for frost fairs to be held. And I'll put a link in the description so you can check that out if you're interested. But suffice to say that from Stuart London until 1814, the surface of the river froze over 24 times. And when it did, conditions were ideal for a very unique celebration to seize the capital. Now, aside from the alarming rise in global temperatures, there are a few other factors that mean we will never again experience frost fairs on the River Thames. For one, the river in 1608 was much wider and shallower, and had not yet been contained within stone embankments. Dr. Cat explains that the banks of the river were littered with points for boats to launch and land. The passage and docking of boats for trade and transportation was much more common, and these factors taken together meant that the river ran more slowly, it was shallower, and therefore was much more liable to undergo a big freeze. And what's more, the old London Bridge was still in existence. Now, you might be thinking, the Thames is crisscrossed with loads of bridges today. How would the existence of the old London Bridge in particular make any difference to conditions? But look at it. This was no ordinary bridge. It looks like its own ramshackle ecosystem full of houses, shops, an old chapel building, water wheels for grinding corn, and the heads of traitors. It was also built on 19 arches supported by small piers with projecting starlings which broke up the flow of the river. In winter, when these arches were blocked with ice and debris, London Bridge almost acted like a dam, slowing the Thames and helping it to freeze. Conditions were perfect. 
The cold weather arrived, the water solidified, and the people came out to play. Filled with glee, you hurtle out onto the ice. Maybe you head over and have some fun in the Tory booth. Or perhaps you get in line to have your name printed on the river as a novelty keepsake. A very lucrative business for the printer who, according to diarist John Evelyn, made five pounds a day for printing a line only at sixpence a name. Evelyn's account is interesting for what it tells us about the festivities that took place at the Frost Fair of 1683-84, but he also takes care to highlight the downside to the intense period of cold. The fair seemed to be a bacchanalian triumph, or carnival on the water, but the severe drop in temperature also led to men and cattle perishing in diverse places, and the very seas so locked up with ice that no vessels could stir out or come in. Many parks of deer were destroyed, and all sorts of fuel so dear that there were great contributions to preserve the poor alive. London, by reason of the excessive coldness of the air hindering the ascent of the smoke, was so filled with fuliginous steam of the sea coal that hardly could one see across the streets. And this, filling the lungs with its gross particles, exceedingly obstructed the breast, so as one could scarcely breathe. Here was no water to be had from the pipes and engines, nor could the brewers and divers other tradesmen work, and every moment was full of disastrous accidents. Evelyn's account cuts through the pageantry and offers an alternate view of frozen London and the effect this weather had, particularly on its poorer inhabitants. Many of the fair's stallholders were out-of-work watermen, whose job it was to ferry people across the river, and whose trade was now literally frozen. As Ariel Hessian and Dan Taylor put it, behind this whimsical scene lay upheaval an early modern cost of living crisis. John Evelyn's is a valuable first-hand account of proceedings that really brings to life this extraordinary period of history. But personally, my favourite account of the Frost Fairs and frozen London isn't Evelyn's. It's a piece of prose much more purple and much more delicious, dictated to us by a gender-fluid time traveller named Orlando, who is the protagonist of Virginia Woolf's 1928 novel, Orlando, A Biography. Now, don't get me wrong, Woolf didn't attend a frost fair. She lived between 1882 and 1941, and the last ever large-scale frost fair was held in 1814. But in Orlando, a story about a young nobleman who travels through time from the Tudor period to the 1920s while changing sex and gender, which, I mean, if that's not the best advert for a book I've ever heard, I don't know what is, the titular character attends the 1608 frost fair and falls in love in one of my favourite ever passages of writing. I invite you to close your eyes and just take this one in. It's so beautiful and I really hope you enjoy it. The Great Frost was, historians tell us, the most severe that has ever visited these islands. Birds froze in mid-air and fell like stones to the ground. At Norwich, a young countrywoman started to cross the road in her usual robust health and was seen by the onlookers to turn visibly to powder and be blown in a puff of dust over the roofs as the icy blast struck her at the street corner. The mortality among sheep and cattle was enormous. Corpses froze and could not be drawn from the sheets. It was no uncommon sight to come upon a whole herd of swine frozen immovable upon the road. The fields were full of shepherds, ploughmen, teams of horses, and little bird-scaring boys, all struck stark in the act of the moment, one with his hand to his nose, another with the bottle to his lips, a third with a stone raised to throw at the ravens who sat, as if stuffed, upon the hedge within a yard of him. The severity of the frost was so extraordinary that a kind of petrifaction sometimes ensued, and it was commonly supposed that the great increase of rooks in some parts of Derbyshire was due to no eruption, for there was none, but to the solidification of unfortunate wayfarers who had been turned literally to stone where they stood. The church could give little help in the matter, and though some landowners had these relics blessed, the most part preferred to use them either as landmarks, scratching posts for sheep, or, when the form of the stone allowed, drinking troughs for cattle, which purposes they serve admirably, for the most part, to this day. But while the country people suffered the extremity of want, and the trade of the country was at a standstill, London enjoyed a carnival of the utmost brilliancy. The court was at Greenwich, and the new king seized the opportunity that his coronation gave him to curry favour with the citizens. He directed that the river, which was frozen to a depth of 20 feet and more for six or seven miles on either side, should be swept, decorated, and given all the semblance of a park or pleasure ground, with arbours, mazes, alleys, drinking booths, etc., at his expense. 
For himself and the courtiers, he reserved a certain space immediately opposite the palace gates, which, railed off from the public only by a silken rope, became at once the centre of the most brilliant society in England. Great statesmen, in their beards and ruffs, dispatched affairs of state under the crimson awning of the royal pagoda. Soldiers planned the conquest of the moor and the downfall of the Turk in striped arbours surmounted by plumes of ostrich feathers. Admirals strode up and down the narrow pathways, glass in hand, sweeping the horizon and telling stories of the Northwest Passage and the Spanish Armada. Lovers dallied upon divans spread with sables. Frozen roses fell in showers when the Queen and her ladies walked abroad. Coloured balloons hovered motionless in the air. Here and there burnt vast bonfires of cedar and oak wood, lavishly salted so that the flames were of green, orange and purple fire. But however fiercely they burnt, the heat was not enough to melt the ice, which, though of singular transparency, was yet of the hardness of steel. So clear indeed was it that they could be seen congealed at a depth of several feet, here a porpoise, there a flounder. Shoals of eels lay motionless in a trance. But whether their state was one of death or merely of suspended animation which the warmth would revive puzzled the philosophers. Near London Bridge, where the river had frozen to a depth of some twenty fathoms, a wrecked wherry boat was plainly visible, lying on the bed of the river where it had sunk last autumn, overladen with apples. The old bumboat woman, who was carrying her fruit to market on the Surrey side, sat there in her plaids and farthingales, with her lap full of apples for all the world, as if she were about to serve a customer, though a certain blueness about the lips hinted the truth. "'Twas a sight King James specially liked to look upon, and he would bring a troop of courtiers to gaze with him. In short, nothing could exceed the brilliancy and gaiety of the scene by day. But it was at night that the carnival was at its merriest, for the frost continued unbroken. The nights were of perfect stillness. The moon and stars blazed with the hard fixity of diamonds, and to the fine music of flute and trumpet, the courtiers danced. Orlando, it is true, was none of those who tread lightly the Coranto and La Volta. He was clumsy and a little absent-minded. He much preferred the plain dances of his own country, which he danced as a child to these fantastic foreign measures. He had, indeed, just brought his feet together about six in the evening of the 7th of January at the finish of some such quadrille or minuet when he beheld, coming from the pavilion of the Muscovite embassy, a figure which, whether boys or women's, for the loose tunic and trousers of the Russian fashion served to disguise the sex, filled him with the highest curiosity. The person, whatever the name or sex, was about middle height, very slenderly fashioned, and dressed entirely in oyster-coloured velvet, trimmed with some unfamiliar greenish-coloured fur. But these details were obscured by the extraordinary seductiveness which issued from the whole person. Images Metaphors of the most extreme and extravagant twined and twisted in his mind. He called her a melon, a pineapple, an olive tree, an emerald, and a fox in the snow, all in the space of three seconds. He did not know whether he had heard her, tasted her, seen her, or all three together. For though we must pause not a moment in the narrative, we may here hastily note that all his images at this time were simple in the extreme to match his senses, and were mostly taken from things he had liked the taste of as a boy. But if his senses were simple, they were at the same time extremely strong. To pause, therefore, and seek the reasons of things is out of the question. A melon, an emerald, a fox in the snow. So he raved, so he stared. When the boy, for alas, a boy it must be, no woman could skate with such speed and vigour, swept almost on tiptoe past him. Orlando was ready to tear his hair with vexation that the person was of his own sex, and thus all embraces were out of the question. But the skater came closer. Legs, hands, carriage were a boy's, but no boy ever had a mouth like that. No boy had those breasts. No boy had eyes which looked as if they had been fished from the bottom of the sea. Finally, coming to a stop and sweeping a curtsy with the utmost grace to the king who was shuffling past on the arm of some lord-in-waiting, the unknown skater came to a standstill. She was not a hand's breadth off. She was a woman. Orlando stared, trembled, turned hot, turned cold, 
longed to hurl himself through the summer air, to crush acorns beneath his feet, to toss his arms with the beech trees and the oaks. As it was, he drew his lips up over his small, white teeth, opened them perhaps half an inch as if to bite, shut them as if he had bitten. The Lady Euphrosyne hung upon his arm. Orlando is a satirical novel. It's a feminist novel. It's a love letter from Wolfe to her lover, Vita Sackville West. It's not an unproblematic novel, with some of Wolfe's language reading as very dated and very offensive by our contemporary standards. But it's also a subversive, and for its time, a radical piece of literature that challenges sex and gender norms, ideas of sexuality, and patriarchal order. It also contains some breathtaking prose. And what I love about this passage in particular is how Wolfe writes both so beautifully and so subversively. I love Wolfe's fantastical spin on the Frost Fair, how she enlarges and abstracts an already pretty fantastical historical event and turns it into something surreal, dazzling, and just a little bit gruesome. Birds freeze and fall from the sky. Women turn to powder and blow away. People are petrified physically by the cold and become blessed relics or scratching posts for sheep. The entire novel is beautifully tongue-in-cheek and unapologetic. Orlando spins through time periods as the skaters do on the ice of the frozen Thames. In Wolf, however, the frozen Thames looks a little different. Remember I said that during the frost of 1683 and 84, the river froze to a record depth of 11 inches? Wolf expands this to 20 feet, then 20 fathoms. It's so astoundingly clear that you can see congealed at a depth of several feet, here a porpoise, there a flounder. You can look into the clear depths and see everything from shipwrecks to droves of eels mid-swim, perfectly preserved, frozen in time, just below the surface. Spectacular to behold, but weird, mysterious, even macabre. We have that fantastic passage about the old bumboat woman, sat on the ship, frozen beneath the water, her lap full of apples for all the world, as if she were about to serve a customer, though a certain blueness about the lips hinted the truth. She's a spectacle that the king and his courtiers like to gaze upon, which Wolf follows with the sardonic, nothing could exceed the brilliancy and gaiety of the scene. Wolf's rich and riotous prose is equal parts beautiful and absurd, glittering, funny, dark, she plays on the celebratory mood of the fairs, the bacchanalian, almost orgiastic experience, the debauchery that John Evelyn hints at, but she makes it more explicit. Rather than a nod towards licentious behaviour, Wolf has lovers dallying on divans set up on the ice, almost inviting them to make a public display of whatever they might get up to. But she also works in the suffering that came with the cold that Evelyn writes about. This is a place where living things are turned to stone where poor women plying their wares become roadside attractions ripe to be gawped at by the rich and powerful. There's this gorgeous jarring quality to proceedings as Wolf writes them. The cold is merciless, but it also feels like something out of a fairy tale. Vast colour-changing bonfires of cedar and oak wood burn brightly, and coloured balloons hover motionless in the air. Right before we get to Orlando himself and his experience on the ice, we get this line. For the frost continued unbroken, the nights were of perfect stillness. The moon and stars blazed with the hard fixity of diamonds. And to the fine music of flute and trumpet, the courtiers danced. This is so gorgeous. I could spend a lot of time just breathing it in. But it's also an interesting image of stasis, as are a lot of the images in this section of the text. Creatures beneath the ice are fixed in motion. People turn to stone. The balloons don't move. The ice doesn't melt, no matter how hot the fires burn. The fields were full of shepherds, ploughmen, teams of horses, and little bird-scaring boys, all struck stark in the act of the moment. The stars and moon are fixed, hard as diamonds, unchanging. But this is very much a novel about change, about challenge, about what can happen if. Orlando sees this person skating on the ice, sex and gender unknown. He, and I'll say he because at this point in the novel, Orlando is still referred to as he, is attracted in a very passionate and sensual way. He is aware that if this person turns out to be male, he can't pursue a sexual relationship with him, which indeed he wouldn't have been legally allowed to do in either 1608 or in 1928 when the novel was published. But Wolfe persists with this line of thought, explores it, and allows her protagonist to revel in the possibility and the attraction. Orlando has his perceptions about sex and gender challenged here. No woman could skate like that, he thinks. Yet it turns out the person that he's lusting after and admiring is indeed a woman, Sasha. His almost orgasmic response when he finds this out, when she comes near, is powerful and telling. As though he's allowed that release because she's not male. But inwardly, 
we know how he feels about this person, regardless of sex or gender. The person, whatever the name or sex, was about middle height, very slenderly fashioned and dressed entirely in oyster-coloured velvet, trimmed with some unfamiliar greenish-coloured fur. But these details were obscured by the extraordinary seductiveness which issued from the whole person. The colours here are wild, absolutely vivid and perfect. I can see this outfit so clearly against the glittering ice, the black sky, diamond stars and witchy bonfires dotted about the river. It's glorious in terms of imagery and in the way Orlando falls for a person, for the whole person, before he knows her name, sex or gender. As Pooja Matal Bisfaz writes, Sasha's breathtaking androgyny explodes the male-female gender binary. And not only does Orlando want her, he experiences a powerful desire to imbibe the essence of what she is, that elfin, indefinable state beyond gender. Sasha is seductive because of who she is as a whole person and what she represents to Orlando. A vision of himself that he has as not yet encountered, a glimpse of what he will become, a queer potentiality. Wolf allows Orlando to revel in this potential, in this person, whoever they might turn out to be. This passage, and indeed the entirety of Orlando, is a testament to Wolf's subversive challenge to gender norms and the straight-laced Victorian morality and ideas of sexuality that she grew up with. The Thames may be frozen fathoms deep, but Wolf's energy, lyrical excellence, and passionate satirical expose of patriarchal b warms me to my core. If you loved Virginia Woolf's fiery purple prose, watch my video on the delicious description and excessively rich imagery of one of my favourite writers, Angela Carter, by clicking here next.